You're listening to Last Word Radio, where you, you get your last word. Welcome to the Fourth Line Podcast, part of the Alberta Podcast Network, powered by ATB. This is July the 29th, 2019. With you today is myself, Carl, and Stevie Nick. Hey, you got the name right this time. <laughs> I did, especially, which is extra surprising considering how early this is. It is pretty early for you. Yeah, we're coming to you uh, 8.30 a.m. on a Saturday. We're recording this one. Just for you. for you. It's almost... It's later for me. Yeah, it, it, it'll be almost afternoon by the time we're done. Yeah. so Great but, start to a Saturday. Yeah, this is... Uh, and you know what? I, I realized as I was saying July 29th, we might release this before July 29th, because why not? Yeah, might as well. It's yeah. a good episode we got. Yeah, we've got a lot of uh, great stuff coming today, and it none of it has to do with current events in hockey. What current events in hockey? Right, yeah. Uh, we could spend the rest of the show diving into uh the leafs cap circumvention with david clarkson if you want to no i'm done talking about the leafs cap circumvention okay can we stop doing favors for the maple leafs yeah we can i know that is is a thing that you talk about every single week (laughs) well we've got a great guest coming on today uh josh riel director of the russian vibe documentary this week is going to be all Triple H all the time. Yeah, and about one of my favorite hockey history topics. Yeah, absolutely. It's the Russian be, invasion. It's going to be a lot of fun, uh, and so we'll get to that very quickly. Before we get to any of it, I want to remind everyone about the Alberta Blue Cross Wellness Summit, which is October 10th in Edmonton. It's a day to explore fresh perspectives and practices around wellness. This year, the focus is on what it takes to create healthy workplace cultures where everyone can thrive. Supporting the mental health and wellness of employees is becoming a major consideration in a lot of workplaces. And Alberta Blue Cross wants to connect the dots of what it takes to create healthier workplaces with happy people, which is super important. And actually what is probably something we'll be talking about in an interview with Josh, how they managed to do that, right? Bringing the five players over from Russia, big, big workplace changes. Oh, if we're talking about workplace changes, there was some stuff going on there that uh, I don't think the HR departments would have liked very much. No, certainly not. Well, this is at the Renaissance Edmonton Airport Hotel, October 10th in Edmonton. Go to thewellnesssummit.ca for more information. Without further ado, should we, should we get into it? Yeah, let's talk to Josh. Welcome back, everyone. Like we mentioned, we have Joshua Rio with us today, director of the Russian Five film. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. So, Privet, Joshua. Dobro pozla lovla na nash podcast. You don't have to answer that. Uh, my Russian is non existent. <laughs> yeah, my Russian is good Slava. Russian. Slava, Slava Fatisov gave some crap about that in Russia, said I have to learn it before the next time I see him, which is going to be September, so I don't have much time. Whoa. That's, uh, that's pretty crazy, getting a direct order from Slava Fatisov like that. Yeah, oh, yeah. When, when Papa Bear tells you to do something, you should probably do it. Yeah, <laughs> you better get in those language classes. <laughs> well, duly, no, here I come. <laughs> That's fantastic. So the Russian Five, uh, can you just let us know, for those who are not aware, who the Russian Five are and why there's a documentary about them? Yeah, so the Russian Five, uh, in order of how they came to, I guess uh, the NHL was, you know, Slava Fatisov, Igor Larionov, Sergei Fedorov, Vladimir Konstantinov, and Slava Kozlov. And, you know, the five were, I mean, they were the first all five man Russian unit to play together in the NHL. Thanks in part to actually thanks in most to Scotty Bowman's sort of genius awareness to realize, you know, when he came to Detroit in 93, 94, they had Sergei, they had Vladdy, they had Kazi, um, you know, but they were still wings as an organization, as a team were taking their, 
their groin pains and their lumps. And, you know, Scotty knew that guys like Slava and Igor would bring some certain intangibles to the locker room. And so first came Slava and, you know, they, they wanted that veteran leadership on the blue line, but someone who could really kind of push Sergey um, to, to be the best all the time. And that was Slava. And so they had four and then, you know, Slava started kind of whispering and, and Scotty's ear, you know, Igor's out there. And the Red Wings had a surplus of wingers and Scotty wanted a more defensive minded center. And so, you know, about six games into the season in 95, 96, he made a trade that, you know, was not initially accepted well in Detroit, which was to trade Ray Shepard, a, a, you know, 40, 50 goal scorer for Igor Larionov, who at that time, I believe was like 36 years old, um, you know, kind of considered on the downside of his career. Uh, but what Scotty knew was that the way these Russians played the game of hockey in back in the Soviet Union was as a consistent five-man group, right? So in the NHL, you'll have your, your forward lines so always stay together, and they'll rotate out, and maybe they'll end up with the same D pair, maybe not. But in the Soviet Union, it was those five guys played together all the time, which created a chemistry, which created a, a sense of knowing where each other would be. Um, so these five guys get thrown on the ice in Calgary, um, you know, it was October 27th, 1995, uh, in Calgary. And the Russian five dominant. You know, the, the wings held Calgary to eight shots in their own home building. Um, I think the Russian five themselves had like 13 shots on goal. So if you think about it, the, the one line outshot the entire Calgary Flames team. Um, they counted for two of the three goals the wings scored that night. And really, it was an eye opening moment for the NHL. And, you know, that really set the wings off on that torrent pace where they set the league record of wings that would, you know, finally be tied by Tampa Bay all these years later this season. But, you know, then they'd run into Colorado. And, and so that kind of, you know, what's at heart of the documentary of the story of the Russian five. That's awesome. Uh, I, you know, kind of low key awesome part of that story is how Scotty Bowman just had complete control of that roster and could make trades Oh yeah, as the head coach. Well, I mean, that was part of the thing of, you know, Jim, when Jim Nevilano brought him in and, you know, they had Brian Murray, who was a great guy and he was a good coach for young guys, but, you know, the knock on Brian Murray was that he never was able to get the job done when he was in Washington before he comes to Detroit. And so, you know, Mike Gillich wanted someone who had gotten the job done and there's no one in the NHL that was, that said it was more than Scotty Bowman, right? So part of bringing him in was to give him some roster control and, you know, so Scotty was the one who really went to Jimmy Delano and was like, I want to trade a third-round pick for, for Slava Fatisov to New Jersey in 95. And, you know, we forget that when that trade happened, Slava was a, a healthy scratch. He was he was not playing. He was sitting up in the press box. And, you know, luckily for all of us, Lou Lamorello really liked Slava as a, a person, as a human. And so he thought, yeah, I want to give this guy a chance to maybe, you know, play a couple more shifts in the NHL. And, and go to Detroit where, you know, he'd be with some other Russians. No, I don't think anyone expected Slava to pay, play, what, three more seasons at that point because of his age. But, you know, he did. And, and he was really, you know, Slava was really kind of the heart of the 98 season where, you know, he was the guy that was in the limo accident with Vladdy. He survived it. Um, he was the one who really kind of helped throw the team on his back and say, hey, you know, we're going to do this. And you know, his leadership is really um, unheralded. And, I mean, the only parallel that I can think of in, in hockey that I know of is, is Steve Eiserman. And so, like, when you have two guys who are basically the greatest captains of their era ever on your team, like, that's a lot of leadership. And Scotty knew that that was kind of the key to getting them over the hump was just kind of having that leadership with those intangibles, you know. Yeah, definitely. And as you mentioned, like set the setting the record there, uh, big changes in Detroit that were able to to really set them forward. So um, when if someone let's get in before we, you know, lose focus on uh, the document, I, I want to get into um, a lot of the history. But b before that, uh, if someone has not seen had the opportunity to yeah. see the Russian five documentary that you made, uh, what kind of areas does it focus on? <sighs> So the film really kind of starts in 1982 when Mike Gillich buys what was 
commonly referred to as the Dead Wings, right? Um, Detroit Red Wings were horrible. The city of Detroit was, you know, in a really bad place. But Mike Gillich wanted to, you know, bring some sort of joy to the city. So they bought the wings and they start this long process. And so that's where it starts. But we really get into it in 89 when the wings go to the draft. And there's some debate. There's a superstar kid sitting there, but he's in the Russian system and they don't know if they'll ever get him. They, the Red Wings saw what Slava and Igor went through when they were drafted by um, New Jersey and Vancouver, respectively, which, you know, it took them, those guys, maybe like four or five years and all of this agreements that the Soviets backed out on. And then it was just a big mess for, for those franchises to finally get those players. And they came at 30 years old. So there's some hesitation, but it's Sergei Fedorov's there on the board in the fourth round, and Jim Nevolano scouts are telling him, this guy's a superstar. And the Red Wings had something that not a lot of other teams had, which was that they had an owner who was willing to do literally whatever it took to, to turn the team around. So, you know, Mike Gillich gave Jim Nevolano permission to, to draft these guys, and then he gave Jim Lights and Nick Polano, sort of the guys who were, were the point men, whatever they needed, you know, and, and that in which case it was a lot of loose cash, right, for bribes and whatnot to get Fedorov and then Konstantinov and then later on Kozlov over. So it, the film takes you through that journey of, of the defections and bringing those guys over. And then we get into the story that I just talked about, which is, you know, Scotty comes in, brings in Slava, brings in Igor, the Russian five assemble. They dominate the league, but they're running in Colorado. And then the film goes from, all right, well, how do they – how do they get back on their feet? How do they get back to the finals and win? And we get into that and we get into how, you know, really the Russians off the ice had just as much impact on the ice as, in, as that team finally winning their first Stanley Cup in 42 years. So, you know, and then we cover what happened after the, the first cup in 42 years, you know, the tragic limo accident and the um, you know, bittersweet victory in 98. So that's kind of the movie in a nutshell. And it's I saw it here in Toronto. It's a it you really did a wonderful job pulling it all together. Uh, especially you know when you're telling the story of the defections, the film creates this this amazing like like back alley, dark hallway ambiance. This it it's like yeah. a spy movie almost, right? On on how they're talking to these players and trying to convince them to come over. Like there's no official channels whatsoever. And, you know, it, well, I was going to say, there, there were some official channels. That story got kind of left in the cutting room floor because it was long and involved. But really what it was is every time they try to go through the official channels, the Russians would say, they're never coming. No matter how much money you give us or offer us, they're not coming. And so Jim Lights just used that more determined to find a way to get them out the other way through the back door. Yeah, but, and see, yeah, that's you know, like that, this part of hockey history about bringing – the Russians over is so fascinating to me because it like it kind of had some political ramifications that transcended hockey right like there was more going on here than just hockey absolutely I mean the, the fact is that you have at that moment in time the Soviet Union is starting to be chipped away and so that kind of strong hold that the coach Victor, Victor Tikhonov and the Russian Red Army had on players like Fatisov and Marianov they're starting to lose that grip right and and Part of it, that's part of it, but the other part is that guys like Sergey and Vladdy and other guys like Alex McGillney or Pavel Bure saw what Tikhonov and the Russian system put guys like Larianov and Fatisov through. And these are the legends, right? These are the guys who we're talking Michael Jordan and Magic Johnson of mm -hmm. Russian hockey. And Tikhonov still not letting them leave for freedom until they're 30. So these young guys said, we don't want that. We want to go to America where we have the freedom, the freedom to do whatever we want after practice. We don't have to live in a military barracks, which is what the Red Army hockey team had to do for 11 months out of the year. They were sequestered away from their families. Um, these guys wanted the taste of freedom that they could have in America that they got little glimpses of when they would do international tournaments and travel with the Red Army team. So you have this moment in history where – you know, this, this empire is crawling or crumbling, excuse me. And the people are finally getting an opportunity to sneak out. And the Red Wings saw that. And, and, you know, in the film, we talk about how, you know, Vladdy actually left the Soviet Union. And it was the Soviet Union when he left. And weeks later, it would be the Russian Federation. 
Um, cause he literally had to escape as the country was dissolving, um, which is really fascinating to me. And, and you know, it's now, it's one of the reasons why this story will never be replicated because the world that they existed in doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it's changed planet. It's yeah. crazy. It's, and, and a lot of us, you know, not, well, I think most of us, uh, probably everyone listening doesn't have any idea what it's like to come out of that. Um, and to be able to, to capture some of those stories is really great to hear. So yeah, you know, I mean, these guys, I was just saying, they gave up everything to come here. So go ahead. Yeah, that, well, I guess that was kind of what I was going to ask is what's at stake for these players when they decide to defect? Yeah, I mean, you know, for Vladdy, I'll start with him because it was a thing where he had a wife and child, right? So he had to be very specific with the Red Wings. I am only going to come if you can get them out. And, you know, what's funny is when they drafted Vladdy, they assumed that he would be the one guy who would not have any interest in coming. But he was the one that was most interested because he wanted a better life for his daughter, right? However, if you fail, if you get caught doing these things, that future for your daughter and for your family is, is taken away. So it was a huge risk. And it was something that, you know, Vladdy and, and his family really had to put their trust in the Red Wings organization because, you know, they sneak Vladdy out of Moscow during the, uh, the, the hardline communist sort of uprising, trying to take the government back. They get him to Budapest and he's, they're ready to go. Jim lights shows up and, and Mike Gilch's private jet. But because this is all last minute, They've only had time to secure Vladdy's visa, right? He has to get on this airplane and leave his wife and daughter in the communist block. The wings say, it's okay, 48 hours, we'll get him out. But can you imagine the, the tension and the anxiety for those 48 hours of knowing that, like, you're headed to America and you're not going to see your wife and daughter for two days and you're not going to be able to protect them. You're not going to be able to do anything for them once, you, once that plane takes off. But Vladdy's wife was like, no, this is what we've gone all this way for. We have to do this. we got to trust them. This is for our future, right? So that was for Vladdy. But, like, that guy like Sergey, you know, the wings tried to get him to just jump right away. But he had to think about what are the ramifications for my family. You know, this was still a point where, you know, yes, the grip of the, the Red Army team was um, looser than it was in the mid-'80s. But it was still a thing where they could get your, your father fired from his job. They could make life difficult for your mother, right? They're not going to your, – your family is probably not going to be murdered or, or maybe not even sent to prison at this point in time. But they are going to have their life made difficult if you don't do things right. And so that's why Sergey was like, no, I need to wait until I'm 20 and I'm out of my military service. So that way I'm not a defector right, or a deserter. And they found a way for him to come to Detroit. And actually, you know, technically, Sergei Fedorov never defected. Um, technically, Sergei Fedorov was already on American soil with a work visa, and he just stayed, is, is with the technicality of how the Red Wings were sort of able to deal with this as far as the, the, the State Department geopolitical ramifications. Um, you know, and the fallout for that was Sergei Fedorov was not allowed to return home for four years until the 94, 95 lockout and Slava Fatisov again, the Papa bear comes in and lobbies the Russian government to get guys like Sergei McGillney, their passports put back so they can return back home for sort of a, a Russian all-star tournament during the lockout. So yeah, I mean, these guys, they risked the, you know, it's not hyperbole to, to say they risked everything um, to come to America to play in, you know, against the best competition in the world. As, as professional athletes. Well, and with, with giving that much up, it's easy to think, uh, you know, leaving that kind of oppressive system behind that everything was great when they came over to the NHL. But what, what mm. was it like, like for Slava coming over right away? How easy was that adjustment going from Russia to the NHL? Yeah, so, I mean, we don't get into Slava's story a whole lot in our film just because we're kind of looking at the, from the scope of the Red Wings, but... I did the research, right? And, and when Slava came over, you know, his locker room didn't necessarily accept him. There were a few guys, and they were the young guys, like uh, Doug Brown and Brendan Shanahan, who looked up to him. But the older players who had been, you know, might have even played against him in international tournaments, they didn't want this, this communist in their locker room, right? And so he faced that in the locker room. Then he gets out on the ice, and, you know, people 
most people forget that Wendell Clark decided to greet Slava Fatisov to the NHL with a sucker punch, right? Mm-hmm. And and then, and then Slava and Wendell just had these epic battles where it really took Slava to kind of saying, I know I'm going to get my ass beat. And I'm not a tough guy like you, but I have to stand up to you just to, to show everyone that I'm not going to take this crap anymore. Um, yeah, and so he stood up to Wendell Clark. And if I recall, Clark dropped him with a single punch, you know. Yeah. Um, but it was a thing where it's like he had to do that. So he's facing, you know, unwelcomeness from guys on the ice in his locker room. And then the referees are turning a blind eye every time someone's taking a cheap shot. Right. So that's just in the hockey world. But then you've got to adjust to a new language, right? A new culture. Um, the fact is, is, you know, in the Soviet Union, these guys could not go to a grocery store and, and get anything, right? There'd be a line because, oh, today we have bread. Everyone can get in line so you can get a, a loaf of bread. They come to America, in, in his case, New Jersey, and they go to the grocery store and there's 16 different kinds of bread, right? And there are all these stories, not just Slava and his wife, but like all these other Russians, both in sports and just people who come here who just find that completely overwhelming. So, you know, that was in 1989, uh, or 88, 89. So by the time Sergei came a year later, it was lessening a little bit, but Sergei comes in the Detroit locker room and you've got guys, again, who have played their entire career. They're on the, the downside of the career and they are afraid oh, now you're bringing in foreigners and they're going to take my job. And it's kind of funny. We're having this conversation in America right now. Um, And what happened was the guys who were losing their jobs hated to see Sergey come in the locker room. But everyone who had a job and who's going to stick around, as soon as they saw how good he was, as soon as they saw him skate on the ice, they were like, oh, this Russian kid's going to make us better. Maybe, Maybe we are open to this, right? Mm-hmm. And so it was this gradual acceptance where at first they accepted him as player because his skill level was just off the charts. And you had a couple guys who embraced him early on. Um, Sean Burr was, was Sergey's close friend, his, his roommate. He taught Sergey everything. Um, but Sean kind of had to protect Sergey from, from some nasty practical jokes. And the truth is that sometimes Sean participated in some of those. Um, there's a funny story that got left in the cutting room floor where, you know, Sean was teaching in- Sergey English and he taught him the word bomb, right? And they're going through airport security. I believe it was like maybe Quebec or Montreal. And a player in front of him, some, his, his bag sets off a little alarm detector. And Sergey goes, it is a bomb. Oh, my God. <laughs> Not knowing what he's saying, the next thing you know, Sergey and the guy, who, the player whose bag it was, are, you know, back in security getting, you know, interrogated and, and Sean Burr had to explain to Brian Murray, like, no, sorry, coach. I, that's my bad. Right. So even from his friends, there was this like little bit of difficulty of language and all that. Um, but the biggest thing is homesickness, right? Uh, especially that first year for Sergey, where nobody's in the locker room speaks your language. You're not used to the food you're eating, you you know, and, and again, like, other than a couple guys, you're not even being embraced by the locker room. And so it's a lonely experience. And, you know, Denise Harris, the flight uh, attendant on Redbird One, is, who's in the film, talked it. Talks in the film and, and outtakes. She talked more extensively about kind of the things that she saw and sort of how Sergey kind of had to gradually win these guys over. Luckily for Sergey, Vladdy came the next season. And so right away, you know, he has someone he can talk to. Him and Vladdy were roommates back in the Red Army Club, living in those military barracks. So he had a friend. He had someone that could feel a little bit more comfortable. And then the season afterwards, Kazi came. So that loneliness wasn't super long. Um, and his family was able to join him a couple in the season afterwards. But still at home, initially, that's hard, right? and you're a professional hockey player, you've got to go out on the ice every other night and perform. And because all eyes are on you is the, you know, this flashy Russian rookie guys are trying to take cheap shots at you. You know, Chris Chelios, he had a lot of nasty chirpy uh, hits on Sergey. All these guys, especially in the central division did. Yeah. So it's, you know, it wasn't all Corvettes and rock and roll concerts for Sergey Federov when he first came to America, that's for sure. 
Yeah, and like the Russian style, I mean, like he was he was perceived as soft when he came over, right? Because you look Absolutely. at some of the the Russian style of hockey versus the North American style back then, and they're so drastically different. And you watch some of it now, not just NHL, but like some of the international footage, and it's almost like art the way they the, they play hockey in that five man unit. Like so, like, through, go, you going through all this old hockey footage for the film, yeah. like what stood out to you about the North American game at the time? and how the Russians played within it. So, I mean, I, it's, it's tricky because I watched all of this footage and basically like almost every shift the Russian five played from 95, 90, 95, 96, 96, 97, which was easier in 96, 97 because people forget Scotty Bowman broke that line up most of the season. Right. Uh, he didn't want, he basically, he didn't want, um, other teams to sort of figure it out. And he also wanted their influence to sort of spread throughout the roster. Um, and you hear that in the film about how, you know, playing with Darren McCarty and Brendan Shanahan, Igor Larionov was able to teach those guys sort of the, sort of the Russian style. Um, but comparing it to North American style, I mean, it's not fair because <laughs> North American style, once you've watched enough of the, the puck possession hockey that the Russian five brought, North American style is almost unwatchable. Um, yeah. And, and it, I hate to say this, but like it was really hard to watch the Red Wings this last season because they don't have those puck moving defensemen that they had in, in the, the better years. Uh, oh, and God, it, tell me about it. You know, and I, well, I just I went from digging through all of this beautiful passing and, and amazing footage to like, oh, man, they just missed a pass and now they're icing it again. <laughs> and oh, you know, it's, it's, it's hard. And, you know, luckily Stevie, Stevie's the right guy to come in and turn this around because he lived that experience. He knows the difference. Right. And he brought Russian influence to Tampa Bay. And you better believe he's going to bring at least that puck possession influence back to the Red Wings. Yeah. So I just want to pause here for a quick second. Cause you, since you brought him up for the record, Carl, I did not bring him up. Steve Eiserman. <laughs> You, you, he's in the film. You interviewed him. Can you just tell me like yeah. one good thing about Steve Eiserman? Like, just give me one tidbit about him. Oh, I mean, he is one of the most cool and collected individuals I've ever met. Um, what's kind of funny is when I watch the interview back, you know, like through the, when you, you're doing the interview, you want these guys to be emotional. And Stevie was just so calm, right? Yeah. And you're like, I'm getting like a, it's funny because I'm like, there's a part of my brain that's geeking out because it's a Steve Eiserman. There's a part of my brain that's like, how do I get through all of these questions that I have for him? Because he wants to get out of the, get out of here in an hour. And then there's this other part that's like, man, how do I get a smile out of this guy? How do I get him to laugh? Cause he is just Mr. Steady Eddie. Right. Yeah. But Darren McCarty has told me afterwards, that's Stevie, man. He is the most just chillax dude you will meet and that's what made him the captain you know that's he wasn't the guy who was rah-rah in the locker room like yeah and because of that when stevie did say something dudes listened right it was like oh shit stevie's making a point it's this is a real point here same thing with scotty bowman you know scotty never gave the players any any big speeches but when he did and he, he and he did in game four in 98 you know that was when these guys are like okay we need, not only do we need to listen, but we need to file this away as, as life lessons. Um, and Stevie's one of those guys, you know, he's, he's quite incredible. Um, just humble dude, really humble. Um, you know, try to not take credit for anything in the interview when I, when I tried to offer it to him, but, uh, that's the kind of Detroit mentality leadership we need to turn the, turn the team around. So it'll be good. Uh, I don't think people should expect too much this season, but I think next year is when the re the rebuild really starts. I love it. That was all music to my ears. Thank you so much. <laughs> smile You're on welcome. Face right now. <laughs> I'm wide, so, uh, you have made him a very happy man. <laughs> so uh, if we look towards today, right? Like it is no longer, I mean, there's still, you know, some players that will drop in the draft because they're from Russia. They have contracts in the K and things like that. Um, right. But it, it's definitely changed, right? Like the top players in Russia oh, oh, yeah. are, com are coming over. You you kind of know that. And, and, you know, Ovi's not dropping in the draft because of right. being Russian. Um, 
So right. from, from these these five, really, as the the core, how is that impacted today? How is how is that kind of trickled down into today's NHL with, with the amount of Russian players there now? Well, I'm going to take a, I'm going to take the scope one one step larger, and I think it's more than just Russians. I think it's the Europeans in general that the Russian five helped. Um, you know, it, it, we're talking about just a minute ago that when Sergey and these Russians came over, and this is the same thing with Swedes and Czechs. They're soft, right? You can't win a Stanley Cup with Europeans. You need good Canadians, right? And that was the mentality of the NHL through the 90s until 97 when the when the Russian five unit won the cup. And what's interesting is actually the New York Rangers won it with four Russians in 94, but they didn't play together. Um, so I think just the, the my mentality of having the Russian five line lead, help lead the wings to – win the cup in 97 really started to change opinions of how the Russians were as players and, and whether or not you could win with them, whether or not they cared about the Stanley cup. Cause that was the other knock was like, Oh, they want to play the regular season, collect their paycheck. And then they want to be done so they can go play the world championships in the summer. They don't care about the Stanley cup. And, you know, Slava and Igor cared about the Stanley cup probably more than most North Americans. You know, it was the last trophy that they hadn't won in the game of hockey period, right? So once that happened, you know, A, you start seeing, yeah, teams taking Russians late earlier and earlier. You know, when Kozlov was drafted in 90, in the third round, that was the highest a Russian was ever taken then. Sergei was the highest in 89 in the fourth round. But I believe it was 93, the New York Rangers take Alex Kovalev, number one overall which, again, by then the Soviet Union collapsed, so the political world situation had changed. But the Russian fire really opened the doors for that, and you know, then you start getting more Europeans, the attitudes about them being soft, they don't care about the Stanley Cup goes away, to the point where right now the NHL is the international sport, right? Like there are, baseball has a lot of Latin American players, but there's, there's not a whole lot of players from, you know, Europe or anywhere else. I think there's a couple of Aussies in baseball, but the NHL has players. I mean, I guess they don't have anyone from South America because they don't really play hockey there, but all across Europe, Russia, even right now, the, the NHL is making roads and hockey is getting really uh, buzzworthy in China right now. So if you think about like the trajectory of the game over these last, you know, really 20, 30 years since the Russians started coming, it really has blown it up from a North American Canadian game to an international one. And I mean, in my opinion, the game has improved because of that bringing in the different styles, the speed. Um, yeah. You know, maybe it's not as, t- as tough or, or rough and, and, you know, maybe they need to kind of bring back the enforcers so that guys are getting less head injuries. And there are some things that we can, take from you know the 90s and 80s era of hockey to improve on what we have today but i wouldn't change the speed of the game hell no yeah it's definitely as like you mentioned like the the amount of russians swedes Finns, Czechs, it's huge uh and hockey's better off for it right the more people we can have playing the game from as many different places many different backgrounds we start to have different styles bleed in like how you know the russian style comes in and you talk about how how nicer it is to watch hockey after you see uh, the Russian Five join the Red Wings. So, oh yeah, um, if someone wants to watch the Russian Five, how can they do that? So right now, the Russian Five is streaming on pretty much all VOD platforms. So you can go to iTunes, you can go to Amazon Prime, uh, Vudu. Uh, what's I, I think you can even rent it on YouTube right now. Um, so yeah, if you just, I mean, if you want to go to the Russian com, all the options are there. We also have DVDs that we sell. Um, and yeah, it's, you know, we had a fun theatrical run sh- kind of showing the movie across the U S uh, from March through June. Now it's out on, you know, streaming. So everyone anywhere can see it. Um, and you know, we're going to take the movie to Russia in September, although 
I've been told it's already been pirated, and apparently the pirates did such a professional job on the dubbing that we are considering pirating the pirates. <laughs> so <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see how that shakes out. But yeah, if just people want to go to the Russian 5com uh, all the information's there. Uh, if they want to follow us on social, um, I think it's Russian 5 Film on Twitter, the Russian 5 on Instagram, and then just the Russian 5 on Facebook. And we're always posting updates. Um, might have some special edition type media coming out in, towards Christmas ish, so they can kind of keep an eye on that. And yeah, anything else that if we put it back in theaters as well, that'll be, that information will be there as well. Well, I have to say, I follow your social channels and you do a great job of posting content, especially for a Red Wings fan. Uh, it's <laughs> really good follow. So I'd recommend everyone um, to go do that. And the film is great. So I highly recommend Thank you. everyone watching the film as well. Absolutely. Thank you. So many places to watch it. Um, if you happen to be in Russia, uh, one, sorry for Nick's Russian earlier, but also <laughs> make sure to check out you know, Summer or this fall rather, um, as you're heading over there, which, which I'm sure for you will be a, a fun experience to kind of take that in a, in a new light. Yeah, I mean, you know, we were there to make the film, but it was Christmas time-ish, it was cold, it was there for work, it was knock out these interviews, and it was stressful because, you know, when we got on the plane to fly to Moscow, Sergei and both Slava said, yeah, we'll do it, we'll do it. But we didn't have a time or a date we didn't know when, and we had 10 days to get these three guys on camera. Um, and luckily, all three of them, you know, it fell into place. But, yeah, it was a little bit of a stressful flight over there, just being like, man, if, if things don't go our way, <laughs> we just blew a lot of money and didn't get what we needed, and then I'm going to have to stick around and miss Christmas. So, yeah, it'll be fun to go back in the fall. Absolutely. Well, thanks again for coming on. The Russian 5com is your place to go. Obviously, check it out. iTunes, Google, Amazon, uh, any of those places that you like to watch videos, it is there and uh, you will not regret it. Spasibo, Joshua. <laughs> Spasibo. <laughs> Spasibo. Ah, oh, damn it. So that was our interview with Josh Reel from uh, the director of the Russian Five documentary that's just been released. Good interview. Good interview. Uh, definitely make sure you check out that documentary because, like, as much as we talked about, there's way more. You can actually like see the interviews with all the people that he had in there. Uh, you don't want to miss that. No, Steve Eiserman's in it. Yeah. Well, and and with you currently wearing your Eiser Plan shirt, it's really fitting. Right. I mean, I'm always wearing my eyes are planned shirt, <laughs> so it's just always really fitting. I guess so. Yeah. Well, and, and it is, you know, a well fit shirt. So he got that going. For yeah. You. Thanks, uh, Carl. <laughs> you're welcome. I mean, if you're going to wear it all the time under everything else, you don't want like a really baggy shirt. Yeah, it's true. No, I know. Yeah. So. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how we get these places. Um, well, Thanks again to Josh. Check it out. Uh, you can go, if you want more information, you can obviously, uh, as you mentioned, you can go to all the places, but the Russian 5.com is a place to go and get more information about that documentary. Uh, and, uh, you know, find out where you can watch it, pick it up, uh, and watch it at home with your friends and family. Da. Uh, is that, is that Russian? That is yes. In Russian, I think. All right. I, I know most of my Russian from watching the Americans on TV. Okay. Yeah. Um, I know none of my Russian from anything. So okay. um, head on over to, if you want more podcasts, especially some great movie podcasts, talking about documentaries, things like that, head over to albertapodcastnetwork.com. Uh, there's always so many great things over there. We, we talk frequently about all the movie shows, but uh, there's a brand new podcast, brand new to the network. And I think it's fitting for, for all of us, uh, it's called This Is Adulting, which I think we could all use a little bit of help with sometimes. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> well, uh, this is about finding yourself in adulthood uh, and discussing it, you know, discussions with life influencers, which is, a, you know, uh, a lot of people who have some experience with that. Um, it's hosted by Danny and Jack. Uh, head on over there. You can find it. You can also go 
to anchor.fm and find their website there. Um, and they, they'll help you walk through it. So their last couple episodes, uh, they talk about pets. Do you, you don't have any pets, do you? I don't have any pets, no. No. The place is too small for pets. Yeah. Would you want pets? No, I wouldn't. Okay. Well, uh, what about road? You, you like road trips, though. I do like road trips. We do a lot of road trips. Well, that was the Just second part of the reason why we don't have pets. Exactly. Well, that, that does hurt the thing. So, uh, yeah, pets, road trips, things like that. Uh, these are all the things that they'll help you walk through, give you some ideas and just talk about them. So uh, head on over and check out This Is Adulting, a brand new show on the Alberta Podcast Network. It's time for us to wrap up another fourth line show. I know what you're thinking. You don't want us to go. We just talked about all things Russian, but on Steve Eiserman, I am really crushing. 